everybody, I am Katerina and I'm super excited to be joining you virtually from my home in Tallinn uh, today to talk about some of the memory things in JavaScript. Uh, we know that on a fundamental level, everything we do on the computer eventually gets turned into binary code, essentially just a bunch of zeros and ones, including everything you write in JavaScript. But how exactly does that happen? And what are all of the different steps it goes through in between? This talk will try to answer that question and is the result of my own journey down the rabbit hole, trying to understand how variables we create in JavaScript get turned into a bunch of zeros and ones. We have a lot of ground to cover and I'll try to go through the whole journey, starting from binary code itself and memory architecture to inner workings of a JavaScript engine like memory allocation and garbage collection. So as I said, we have quite a lot of things to go through. So I invite you to this journey down the rabbit hole with me where I will show you around. And let's start at the beginning with those zeros and ones and understand how computers store and represent information. So zero or one is the smallest fraction of information there is. It's like on and off switch or true or false. In older computers, there were literal light bulbs that glowed for one and were dark for zero. And it is called one bit of information. And with combinations of these bits, we can represent all sorts of data. Small numbers, big numbers, characters, emoji, and even the answer to the ultimate question of life, universe, and everything. But how do computers store these bits? There are different types of memory computers use that store them in their own unique ways. For example, DVD disks use small indentations on the space that reflect light differently when being shined on with a laser. And floppy disks, if you remember those, used magnetic decoding. So when the reading had passed through um, the disk itself, it could read that information. But when it comes to memory our JavaScript applications use, we are primarily dealing with RAM or random access memory. It's a working memory that CPU uses while running applications. And let's see a little bit more in detail how it works. So first of all, it consists of these memory cells, and we can think of them as like tiny, tiny storage boxes with the main idea that we can write to them and read from them, and they can hold charge for some time. On the hardware level, they're implemented as an electric circuit with transistors or a combination of transistor and capacitor. But single cell isn't much use on its own. So we can arrange the cells in a grid and then use the address system to specify which cell exactly we need. And we can think of it as like a street and house address in real life, where the first part will specify the column and the second part will specify the row. And then we can read the contents of the memory cell at the intersection. So we just read one bit of information. However, isn't, it isn't enough in the modern computing. So we need a way to manipulate more bits simultaneously. To do that, we can arrange these grids in an array, allowing us to use the same address to access multiple memory cells at once. So using this 8-bit address, we are, we are able to read one byte of data at a time. It's helpful to think of it as like a match between address and then the data it holds. To simplify, we can convert address in a decimal format and then represent all available memory as this kind of array of addresses and corresponding values that they hold. The current RAM we are using supports 8-bit addresses, which means that in total we can store 256 bytes, which is very little in modern computing, but this is an example of memory older computers used, often referred to as 8-bit memory architecture. Modern computers operate on 32 or 64 bit architecture instead, which means that addresses got a lot longer and therefore they're usually represented in hexadecimal format, like you see right now on the screen. But the core principles we just discussed still apply. While we are talking about physical RAM, it's important to note that applications, when they run on the computer, they don't interface with physical memory directly. Instead, operating system maintains this additional layer of abstraction known as virtual memory. 
It maps to the physical RAM under the hood, but gives operating system the flexibility to, for example, reroute some of the data to the hard drive when physical RAM is running low. It helps to manage memory usage more efficiently and alleviate some security concerns, but also creates this illusion of a large continuous memory space available to the processes that run on the computer. Now, let's say we want to store something in this memory. More often than not, whatever we want to store, let's say it in a variable in our code, it won't fit into one byte. So then it occupies a continuous segment of cells in the address space. And often this is referred to as the first address in that sequence. And it is called a pointer, meaning that this address points to the location memory where the data begins. And from there, we can just follow along until we cover the size of the data that we are storing. In languages like C and C++, you as developer need to manage memory allocation manually and operate with these pointers within the language. For example, this piece of code in C allocates memory for an array of 10 integers. What we do here is we multiply 10 by the size of type integer to allocate the memory needed to store it. And after we have used that array, we need not to forget to free the memory that was associated with it explicitly. As you can see, this is quite a lot of work to do every time you want to you wanna store something. And this is quite a lot of things to remember when you're writing code. At the same time, it gives quite a lot of power to optimize memory consumption. Now, if we think about JavaScript, uh, we don't need to do any of that, right? We can just go around defining arrays left and right, fill them with whatever we want, and not give a second thought about memory consumption. And it's actually a good thing. JavaScript is a high-level language, which means it does a lot of things for us so that we as developers can focus on building features and delivering value to the users and all of the memory allocation along with some other things is done behind the scenes for us by a JavaScript engine. So JavaScript engine itself is just kind of a program that runs within the runtime environment, be it like a browser or Node.js, that takes the JavaScript code that you wrote which is essentially just a long piece of text and turns it into machine code that can be executed by CPU. And it goes through a lot of different transformations that we won't go deep into right now, but I think that's enough to understand, it just takes your code and turns it into machine code. And there are a lot of different engines out there. Uh, for example, there's V8 developed by Google, SpiderMonkey used in Firefox developed by Mozilla, and JavaScript Core, which is part of WebKit and is used in Safari developed by Apple. In this talk, I will focus on V8, which is arguably the most popular of them all. It is used in Chrome and other Chromium-based browsers like Edge and Opera, Node.js and Deno, Electron and more. V8 itself is written in C++ and it's open source. So if you wanted, you can just go ahead and check out the code for yourself. It's pretty well documented and there's like a lot of instruction online how even run the developer version on your computer. Now let's take this piece of code and follow it down the rabbit hole, uh, trying to understand how V8 allocates memory for it. First of all, there are two types of memory V8 uses under the hood. There is stack memory and heap memory. Stack is the region of memory that allocates local context when executing your code. And heap is a much larger region that stores everything that is allocated dynamically, say your objects, functions, arrays, etc. And second heap is not something that is unique to V8. These are common ways to structure data, each with their own ways of accessing and adding your data into the structure. Now, getting back to our code, uh, when interpreter reaches the line with the variable declaration, first it needs to allocate new memory for this object on the heap. Since JavaScript is a dynamically typed language, it doesn't know in advance how much space something will occupy in the future. So it calculates the approximate amount of space something will take based on its own kind of logic and some heuristics it has. Then the string itself that we have within the object will be stored in a different address, whereas the original object will be pointing to it. This is important to note here that primitive values in JavaScript are actually allocated on the heap, uh, except for small integers. 
Then, of course, the pointer to the rabbit variable on the stack is updated, and then the code can be executed. You can actually see the structure in the uh, um, memory tab if you run heap snapshot in Chrome DevTools, let's say. So here you can see the object that we just created. And under the hood, V8 uses this superclass called heap object for everything that is allocated on the heap and contains pointers to all of the internal values plus a lot of some useful metadata that V8 uses for some optimizations that we won't go deep into right now. Now to connect back to what we discussed before about RAM memory, both of these actually map to the actual space in the virtual memory dedicated to our process and by extension in the physical RAM. Now, as our programs runs, more and more things get allocated on the heap. And if we zoom out, we can see that both stack and heap are located on different sides of the virtual memory segment dedicated to our application. And as we fill it with more and more data, they start growing towards each other into the free space. But it's not like our application is the only thing running on the computer. So we need to share memory with other applications. And in the case of the browser, even with other tabs and browser plugins you might have open. And it might give a little bit more insight of why Chrome can be so memory hungry sometimes. Yeah, I love this GIF. <laughs> so uh, let's continue and explore a little bit more complicated examples and see what happens on the heap. From here on out, I'm not going to be showing stack memory, but you can remember that it's still there. It stores all of the local context as your code continues to execute. Now, let's say we create another variable here, which also has a string value of white. So these two are basically the same string. And it presents an interesting situation for V8, because if we are to allocate new memory space for it to store the string kind of again, it won't be something efficient. So instead, V8 uses a technique called string interlining. So it basically detects that this is the same string. And instead of allocating new memory, it just kind of both of them will be pointing to the same location. And this is brings to an important point that most of the variables in JavaScript are essentially just pointers to places where values are stored. Uh, now, let's say that what will happen in when we reassign foo's value to a new string. Because strings are immutable, right, we'll create a new string somewhere and then foo will change its pointer to point to the new location. I really liked the analogy from Dan Abramov's Just JavaScript course, where he suggested to think of variables as wires that are pointing somewhere. So we can imagine all of the variables we create in JavaScript as this kind of like wires connected to location with locations where these values are stored. So when we create four initially, it just connects to the same place. And then when we reassign it, this wire changes its kind of like end location. Now let's explore another, a little bit more complicated example. So here we have an object with two properties, right? And then we create another variable and assign it to the previous object. And then we change uh, one of its properties. And if we try to access the original properties, kind of name, uh, the original object's name value, we would see that it got changed as well. So when we made an update here, it got changed here too. This is something that is called modification by reference. And sometimes it can be tricky if you're not careful. So to understand more why that happens, let's look at the heap. So here on the left, we have our code. Uh, we already know how to declare an object. The only difference here that it has two properties, right? Now, when we uh, create another object here and assign it to the same one, both of them will be pointing to the same location. So instead of copying the whole object over, these are both are basically the same, the same pointer. So that when we make an update here, we will allocate space for the new string and we'll update it in the object's original location. And because both of them point to it, it, it will get updated in both. If we zoom out and get back to our mental model, this is what happens. 
and you see that name got updated in both objects here. To avoid this behavior, we could use something like a spread operator, like this. In that case, when we update the uh, name property, the original object will keep its original value. Uh, let's see what happened. So the spread operator will copy all of the top-level properties of an object. Therefore, when you make a change, it won't affect the original object itself. So now they have different names. Uh, but it is kind of interesting that it uh, wouldn't help for all of the nested objects out there. So here we have a deep nested object that describes our rabbit's <laughs> coat. Uh, now let's see what happens here. So when we update the deep nested property here, we would see that though we use the spread operator, the original object got changed as well. Let's see why that happens. So when we use the spread operator, it copied only top level properties, often referred as shallow copying, right? So then when we update the color property, you see that because both of the object's internal code object was pointing to the same location, it got updated in both of them at the same time. And this is, uh, again, modification by reference. And because it works for all of the nested objects out there, it can be tricky and can result in some bugs that are really hard to find. So for example, if you're using React and you have a component that receives an object as a prop, and then modifies it somewhere by reference within its code, it can result in this object getting updated in the parent component and in parent of the parent component and maybe going back to your Redux store or whatever else state management solution you're using. And this is exactly why immutability got popular in the framework some time ago, because um, kind of libraries like Immutable.js and others, they make sure that references to all pointers are recreated and not copied. So this is just an important thing to keep in mind. When you're modifying by reference, your objects, or functions, arrays, everything that is not a primitive value, it can backfire like that and, and kind of just modify it everywhere because all of them are basically pointing to the same location. Now, we talked a lot about memory allocation, right? So we were creating a lot of things and putting them into the memory. But what about freeing the memory that we don't use anymore? So for example, here we have the string white, right? And after we change the code's color, we don't need this anymore. It's not used anywhere. And this is uh, uh, something that can be considered garbage, right? And this is kind of unused memory. And languages like C and C++, as we explored an example before, you actually need to go and free this memory explicitly yourself as a developer. But JavaScript, um, Kind of runs an automated garbage collector and within V8, the garbage collector it uses called Ornico. Um, and let's dive a little bit more how garbage collection works and how all of the data that we kind of create in JavaScript after it's not used gets collected. But before that, let's understand how generally V8 can detect whether something is garbage or it's not. So we can represent all objects, everything we have in our application as this kind of chain of references that goes from the root. And as our program runs, the same as we just, just saw in the example before, some of those references stop existing. And it means that these parts are not reachable from the root anymore. Therefore, memory associated with them can be freed and used for the new allocations. But if we look at the memory array, and then just like free some of the memory that is associated with it, it can leave our memory fragmented, which means that there's a lot of different gaps in there and it's really hard to allocate anything new into the memory because we don't have a lot of like the big spaces available for the new allocations. So uh, to make more space available for the new allocations, the memory can be compacted so that we have a longer continuous chunk available in the end. This process is really similar to this, if you remember old Windows operating system, there was this disk defragmenter utility that would defragment your hard drive. And this is a really similar process. Current operating system, of course, do this automatically for you. So utilities like that are not needed anymore. Uh, but this is a very similar process. Now, as we understood how V8 can detect whether something is, is garbage or it's still used, let's dive a little bit deeper into how garbage collection algorithm itself works. 
all heap is split between two main generations. We have young generation and old generations. And let's go uh, through them one by one and start with young generation first. So this is where all of the new objects get allocated. It is fairly small, usually on the size between one to eight megabytes. And within itself, it's split into two equal parts. And right now we'll see why. They are called from space and to space. So let's say our program runs and new projects get allocated into the memory. But then at some point, the moment comes when we are trying to allocate something, but there is just not enough space for it. And this is what triggers the garbage collection cycle. So uh, V8 starts the garbage collection and stops the execution cycle un until the cleanup has finished. So first of all, it needs to understand which objects are alive or not. So it goes through that chain of references that we just talked about and traverses from the root once and then copies all of the objects that are still alive from, from space to, to space. So this is why they're called like that. Now, everything we had before can be cleared, but before doing that, one really important thing that we need not to forget to update those references that we're pointing to those objects, like that. Now, everything can be safely removed, uh, and we can swap these two places in place and continue the execution cycle. So garbage collection is finished and we can continue the execution and allocate memory for the object that has been waiting. As I said before, uh, the garbage collection stops the execution cycle for some time and it is often referred to as stop the world because if you look at the main thread, it kind of blocks the main thread until the garbage collection is finished. And in older versions of uh, V8, you could actually see like a small lag when, for example, you would click a button because garbage collector was doing its job. Uh, but right now, V8 actually does a lot of work in parallel so uh, a lot of this garbage collection work is paralyzing up to seven threads and is usually just taking a few milliseconds and doesn't halt the main thread for a long time. This algorithm that we just talked about is, is very fast, right? And, and it's fairly simple. It's called scavenger or is often referred to as minor garbage collector. But at the same time, it's very memory hungry. We always need twice as needed memory to facilitate the algorithm's work, right? We always need to ha have that like from space and to space so that we can copy over and swap things in place. Another imp important thing to note here is that at, at the same time of kind of like cleaning the memory, it also does compaction over it because when we clean, there's a lot of kind of new continuous chunk of memory available for the new allocations. And the fact that it's so kind of memory hungry uh, is okay for small amount of space, but of course it wouldn't be sustainable for everything. So it brings us to while all generation exists. So V8 follows what is called generational hypothesis, uh, which means, it sounds really depressing, <laughs> which means that most objects die young. So it means that they get allocated and almost immediately become unreachable. And if you look at the way you write your own code, you can even see those patterns of why that happens. So you might have a function that you create a temporary object for, then you do some calculations with it, return a value, and this object is not needed anymore almost immediately after it got created. So this is why all generation exists. And as garbage collection is run in the young generation, objects that survive the cycle are marked as intermediate. And after the young generation fills up again and we run the second cycle, if there's any intermediate objects that are still alive, they will get, instead of staying in the young generation, they will get promoted into the old generation instead. Statistically, around only 20% of the objects survive into the old generation. Now let's talk a little bit more in detail about the old generation itself. It takes most of the heap and it's way bigger. And this is where most of the data is actually stored. For garbage collection, it uses what is called mark, sweep and compact algorithm. And let's go on it kind of step by step and let's look at marking first. So remember that chain of references that we talked about? Uh, 
So V8 traverses through the, all of those references and marks the ones that are accessible from the root. After that, everything that is not accessible can be swept, which brings us to the, to the sweep part. And the way that free memory is managed is actually really interesting. So the whole heap is divided into these sections that are called pages, which are basically just segments of memory that is available for the allocations. And as some of the memory is freed, there are some gaps that appear within those pages. And if we would just go through the whole heap, trying to find like the next available space, it wouldn't be very efficient. So the way it works, it maintains this structure called free list, which is like a dictionary with all of the free locations available for the allocations. And they are categorized by size. We can think of it as like Airbnb for memory locations. Uh, so here we have, for example, three locations of size one available, and then three locations of size two available. Of course, in reality, there is like a lot more in there. Now, when we, a new object needs to get allocated, we detect its size, and then we can find a suitable location in the free list. So it is a size two, so there's this location of size two available, and then this object can be located there. After it is located, of course, this location needs to be removed from the free list so that because it's not available for the new allocations anymore. Uh, and we can continue the execution. So uh, we talked a little bit about how the memory is freed, right? And how free memory is managed. Um, but let's talk a little bit about compaction now. Uh, as our program runs, and we free more and more memory, some pages become too fragmented. So V8 runs an internal heuristic that detects the pages that are on the brink of becoming too fragmented to operate. And then it runs compaction on them. Compaction process itself is fairly simple and it's really familiar to what we just saw in the young generation itself. So it just copies over uh, all of the uh, occupied spaces into the new page. And of course, we need not to forget to update all of the associated references. Then everything in the old page can be safely removed. And now we have a longer continuous chunk of memory available for the new allocations. Which is then added to the free list and kind of like the execution continues as we discussed before. Now let's see how this garbage collection is actually executed by V8. So first of all, as our JavaScript runs and V8 detects that the heap limit is approaching, uh, then it um, uh, starts the marking work. And marking work can be actually done concurrently, so without any blocking of the main thread. So it is split between a number of worker threads instead, but of course there is still a little bit of kind of like this finalization of marking where it takes the work that was done in other threads and kind of puts it all together that is done in the main thread. Then uh, we go into sweeping part, right? Where we need to clean the, uh, clean the memory that is associated. So sweeping actually can be done uh, kind of concurrently because everything we do is just kind of make those spaces available in the free list. But compaction, because it involves updating references to existing objects, done in parallel over multiple threads. And after all of this is done, the execution can continue. And this is relatively fast, but of course it depends on how, how many things you actually store on the heap and on your heap size. Now we've covered minor garbage collector for young generation and ma major garbage collector for old generation. And this is where I would like to wrap up this story. But before finishing, let's do a little bit of a recap. So when we write the code in JavaScript, essentially it's just a long piece of text. To be executed, it needs to be run in the runtime environment, such as browser or Node.js. And within that environment, there is a JavaScript engine like V8 and others that takes your code and processes it to be to transform to the machine code that can be executed by CPU. Within itself, to store all of the values you create, engine uses two types of memory, a stack and heap. Stack is just for all of the execution context. 
and heap is a way larger segment of memory that allocates everything uh, that is allocated that stores everything that is allocated dynamically. Uh, and there's not only allocation, right? We also need to free memory. And V8 does it for you automatically by running a garbage collection. And there is a minor garbage collector for the young generation and major garbage collector for uh, rest of the heap. Then, of course, all of the stuff that you uh, that is stored within V8 in heap and stack is actually stored in the virtual memory array that is dedicated to the process by operating system. And that actually translates into the actual physical RAM card that you have in your computer. And that stores zeros and ones in its memory cells. And this is just kind of part of the picture. I tried to cover the, the whole story, but there's a lot of other really interesting stuff happening there under the hood. Uh, but I hope you like this overview and it gave you a little bit more insight about all of the things that happen behind the scenes when you're creating variables in JavaScript. So uh, thank you <laughs> for the attention. I am um, super happy to hear any questions, ideas, or feedback you might have. Uh, you can find me on this uh, social media that you see right now on the screen. And yeah, thank you for the attention.